Today is day two for the Come Follow Me study for this week, December 18th to the 24th. Christmas, good tidings of great joy. Tuesday, December 19th, 2023, Christmas week. In Matthew 1, 18 through 25 and Luke 1, 26 through 35, notice how Matthew and Luke described the miracle of Jesus' birth. Annunciation to Mary. Long before her birth, prophets knew of Mary's sacred role as the mortal mother of Jesus Christ, and they identified her by name. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that in the world, before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments, while faithful men were foreordained to certain... President Spencer W. Kimball taught that in the world, before we came here, faithful women were given certain assignments while faithful men were foreordained to certain priesthood tasks. Elder Bruce McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why Mary was chosen to be the mortal mother of Jesus Christ. As there is only one Christ, so there is only one Mary. And as the Father chose the most noble and righteous of all his spirit sons to come into mortality as his only begotten in the flesh, so we may confidently conclude that he selected the most worthy and spiritually talented of all his spirit daughters to be the mortal mother of his eternal son. Mary is a great role model for women. She exemplifies the attributes that a woman today should seek to develop in her life. Luke one twenty six, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. In the Bible dictionary under Gabriel it says, Man of God, the name of an angel sent to Daniel to Zacharias, and to Mary. He is identified by Latter-day Revelation as Noah. Luke 1, 27-30 To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, or courage, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Why might the people in this verse have been fearful? What causes us to feel fearful? How does God invite us to fear not? Elder James E. Talmadge of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the importance of Gabriel's declaration regarding the parentage of Jesus Christ. That child to be born of Mary was of right to be called the Son of the Highest. In his nature would be combined the powers of Godhood with the capacity and possibilities of mortality. The child Jesus was to inherit the physical, mental, and spiritual traits, tendencies, and powers that characterized his parents, one immortal and glorified God, the, the other human, woman. Elder Talmadge also taught that through Jesus' mortal mother Mary, he inherited the ability to lay down his life voluntarily. But from his heavenly father, Jesus inherited the ability to endure suffering during his atoning sacrifice, such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible, since this suffering would be more than man could suffer except it be unto death. Only a being with power over death could endure it. President Russell M. Nelson declared, From his immortal father Jesus inherited the power to live forever. From his mortal mother he inherited the fate of physical death. Those unique attributes were essential for his mission to atone for the sins of all mankind. Thus Jesus the Christ was born to die. He died that we might live. He was born that all humankind could live beyond the grave. Luke one thirty one. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, When the time of this Savior's advent was at hand, an angel was sent to announce to Mary that she was to be the mother of the Son of God. Then a host of angels was commissioned to sing on the night the baby Jesus was born. Shortly thereafter, an angel would announce to Joseph that the newborn baby was in danger and that his little family must flee to Egypt for safety. From the beginning down through the dispensations, God has used angels as his emissaries in conveying love and concern for his children. Usually such beings are not seen. Sometimes they are. 
but seen or unseen, they are always near. Sometimes their assignments are very grand and have significance for the whole world. Sometimes the messages are more private. Occasionally, the angelic purpose is to warn. But most often it is to comfort, to provide some form of merciful attention, guidance in difficult times. Search for names or titles of Jesus Christ. What do these names mean, and what do they teach us about Jesus? Luke 1, 32-33 He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. When Mary asked how she could become the mother of Jesus, seeing I know not a man, Gabriel simply informed her that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Ghost and that her child would be the Son of God. Other scriptures that refer to the conception of Jesus Christ likewise emphasize that he is the Son of God, but do not reveal how this miracle took place. President Ezra Taft Benson cited these particular scriptures and then Fort Rightly affirmed that the testimonies of appointed witnesses leave no question as to the paternity of Jesus Christ. God was the father of his fleshy tabernacle, and Mary, a mortal woman, was his mother. He was not the son of Joseph, nor was he begotten by the Holy Ghost. He is the son of the Eternal Father. President Benson further taught Jesus Christ was the only begotten son of our Heavenly Father in the flesh, the only child whose mortal body was begotten by our Heavenly Father. His mortal mother Mary was called a virgin, both before and after she gave birth. President Harold B. Lee offered this caution. Remember that the being who was brought about by Mary's conception was a divine personage. We need not question God the Father's method to accomplish his purposes. Perhaps we could do well to remember the words of Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let the Lord rest his case with this declaration and wait until he sees fit to tell us more. God's ways, words, and thoughts are not like ours. They are higher and greater. As the rain comes down from heaven to help crops grow and provide food for us, so will the words of God feed and prosper our souls if we incline our ears to hear his word. But often we are tempted to forget God and trust in our own wisdom or reject God's way of doing things because they are not done as we think they should be done. Elder John Taylor commented on the passage in Isaiah. We know in part, and see in part, and comprehend in part, and many of the things of God are hid from our view, both things that are past, things that are present, and things that are to come. Hence the world in general sit in judgment upon the actions of God that are passing among them. They make use of the weak judgment that God has given them, to scan the designs of God, to unravel the mysteries that are past, and things that are still hid, forgetting that no man knows the things of God but by the Spirit of God, forgetting that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, forgetting that no man in and of himself is competent to unravel the designs and know the purposes of Jehovah, whether in relation to the past, present, or future, and hence forgetting this, they fall into all kinds of blunders, they blunder over things that are contained in the scriptures, some of which are a representation of the follies and weaknesses of men, and some of them perhaps may be the wisdom and intelligence of God, that are as far above their wisdom and intelligence as the heavens are above the earth. Luke one thirty four. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Search for names or titles of Jesus Christ. What do these names mean? And what do they teach us about Jesus? Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy being that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God.
Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that Holy Child, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. President Russell M. Nelson explained that the Atonement of Jesus Christ required a personal sacrifice by an immortal being not subject to death, yet he must die to take up his own body again. The Savior was the only one who could accomplish this. From his mother he inherited power to die. From his father he obtained power over death. As a witness to Mary, that with God nothing shall be impossible, the angel Gabriel testified that Mary's cousin Elizabeth, who was an aged and barren woman, was six months pregnant. This was a witness to Mary that she could also have a child in a miraculous manner. Luke 1, 36-37 And behold thy cousin, or relative, not necessarily a cousin, Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. To help your family build faith that with God nothing shall be impossible, you could search Luke 1 together and find things God did that might be considered impossible. What other stories can we share from the scriptures or our own lives in which God did seemingly impossible things? Elder Russell M. Nelson said, You who may be monetarily disheartened, remember, life is not meant to be easy. Trials must be borne and grief endured along the way. As you remember that with God nothing shall be impossible, know that He is your Father. You are a son or daughter created in His image, entitled through your worthiness to receive revelation to help with your righteous endeavors. You may take upon you the holy name of the Lord. You can qualify to speak in the sacred name of God. It matters not that giants of tribulation torment you. Your prayerful access to help is just as real as when David battled his Goliath. Foster your faith. Fuse your focus with an eye single to the glory of God. Be strong and courageous, and you will be given power and protection from on high. For I will go before your face, the Lord declared. I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts and mine angels round about you to bear you up. Luke one thirty eight. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Elder L. Whitney Clayton said, Mary humbly responded that she would do what God asked without demanding to know specifics, and undoubtedly in spite of having countless questions about the implications for her life. She committed herself without exactly understanding why he was asking that of her or how things would work out. She accepted God's word unconditionally and in advance with little knowledge of what lay ahead. With simple trust in God, Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. 
when we decide to do whatsoever God saith unto us, we earnestly commit to align our everyday behavior with God's will. Such simple acts of faith as studying the scriptures daily, fasting regularly, and praying with real intent deepen our well of spiritual capacity to meet the demands of mortality. Over time, simple habits of belief lead to miraculous results. They transform our faith from a seedling into a dynamic power for good in our lives. Then, when challenges come our way, our rootedness in Christ provides steadfastness for our souls. God shores up our weaknesses, increases our joys, and causes all things to work together for our good. Mary's Consecrated Utterance Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, signaled her complete willingness to accept and to fulfill her sacred role. Her faith, obedience, and humility set a standard for all women. To better understand the difficulties Mary may have faced after receiving her calling as the mother of the Son of God, see the commentary on Matthew 1, 18-25. In the same way that Mary eagerly accepted her opportunity to be a mother, women today can prepare to fulfill their own divine potential as mothers. Sister Julie B. Beck, while serving as a counselor in the Young Women General Presidency, offered the following encouragement. Oh, that every girl and woman would have a testimony of her potential for eternal motherhood as she keeps her earthly covenants. Female roles did not begin on earth, and they do not end here. A woman who treasures motherhood on earth will treasure motherhood in the world to come. And where her treasure is, there will her heart be also. By developing a mother heart, each girl and woman prepares for her divine eternal mission for motherhood. In my experience, I have seen that some of the truest mother hearts beat in the breast of women who will not rear their own children in this life. But they know that all things must come to pass in their time, and that they are laying the foundation of a great work. A woman with a mother heart knows that the influence of righteous, conscientious, persistent, daily mothering is far more lasting, far more powerful, far more influential than any earthly position or institution invented by man. She has the vision that, if worthy, she has the potential to be blessed as Rebecca of old to be the mother of thousands of millions. See also Luke twenty two forty two, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Annunciation to Joseph Matthew 1, 18. Now, as it is written, the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise, or in this way, when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Marriage between a young man and a young woman was arranged and agreed to by the heads of the respective families, usually the fathers. Once a prospective wife had been identified by the groom's father or family head, negotiations were begun. They focused on, but were not limited to, the size of the bride price, a kind of dowry in reverse, paid by the groom's father or family head to the bride's family. Once the marriage was agreed upon, the wedding consisted of two stages, betrothal, also called espousal, and a wedding ceremony. Betrothal was legally and religiously more significant than the subsequent marriage ceremony, after which the couple began living together. Betrothal was regarded as the final part of a solemn covenant. It carried the force of a covenant to be honored between God-fearing parties. Though betrothed couples were legally regarded as husband and wife, between the time of betrothal and the wedding ceremony, a strict code of chastity was enforced. When Mary was found to be a child, Joseph, knowing he was not the father, had several options. First, he could have subjected Mary to a public divorce and perhaps even execution, for people would have presumed that Mary was guilty of adultery, a crime punishable by death under the law of Moses. Second, Joseph could have had his betrothal to Mary privately annulled before two witnesses. A third option was to proceed with the marriage. Joseph was inclined to show mercy to Mary by quietly annulling the betrothal agreement, However, when assured by an angel that Mary's child was the Son of God, Joseph elected to marry her, though doing so could have brought upon him public shame and ridicule. 
Gerald and Lund, who later became a member of the 70, discussed Joseph's visions and spiritual sensitivity. Matthew tells us that Joseph was of the lineage of King David, that he was a just and considerate man, that in a dream an angel told him who Jesus would be, that he was obedient, and that he gave Jesus his name, which means Savior. We know that he took Mary to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. Less than two years later, Joseph took his family into Egypt to escape Herod after being warned in a dream. In Egypt, a dream again told him when to return, and another dream told him when to go to Galilee. Four dreams from God. Joseph must have been an exceptionally visionary and spiritually sensitive man. Matthew 1, 19-20 then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily, i.e. desired to release or divorce her secretly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Alma explained the role of the Holy Ghost in the conception of Jesus Christ. And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained the location of the Savior's birth as declared by Alma. There is no conflict or contradiction in the Book of Mormon, with any truth recorded in the Bible. A careful reading of what Alma said will show that he had no intention of declaring that Jesus would be born in Jerusalem. Alma knew better. So did Joseph Smith and those who were associated with him in the bringing forth of the Book of Mormon. Had Alma said, born in Jerusalem, the city of our fathers, it would have made all the difference in the world. Then we would have said he made an error. Alma made no mistake, and what he said is true. Dr. Hugh Nibley, in his course of study for the priesthood for 1957, An Approach to the Book of Mormon, in Lesson 8, page 85, has this to say on this point. One of the favorite points of attack on the Book of Mormon has been the statement in Alma 710 that the Savior would be born at Jerusalem, which is the land of our forefathers. Here, Jerusalem is not the city in the land of our forefathers. It is the land. Jesus was born in a village some six miles from the city of Jerusalem. It was not in the city, but it was in what we now know the ancients themselves designated as the land of Jerusalem. Both Jerusalem and Bethlehem have been called the city of David, which has caused some confusion. Luke 2.11 refers to Bethlehem as the city of David, yet 2 Samuel 5, 6 through 8 and 2 Kings 14-20 through 20 and 1 Chronicles 11, 4 through 8 all refer to Jerusalem as the city of David. Search for names or titles of Jesus Christ. What do these names mean, and what do they teach us about Jesus? Matthew 1, 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus comes from Eosis, a Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua, Joshua in English, Yeshua means Jehovah saves, and the long form of the name Yehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. Both forms of the name bear witness of the identity and mission of Jesus Christ, who was Jehovah in the premortal life. Matthew described the Savior's mission of salvation by declaring, He shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.22 now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Search for names or titles of Jesus Christ. What do these names mean, and what do they teach us about Jesus? Matthew one twenty three. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The first chapter in Matthew announces that Jesus Christ will be called in Hebrew Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. The last verse in Matthew contains the Savior's promise to his disciples, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. By placing these parallel declarations at the beginning and the end of his gospel, Matthew may be identifying a message running throughout the gospel of Matthew. God will not forget us. He is with us always. 
The Savior promised to be with his followers always, a promise that must have been of great comfort to them. President Thomas S. Monson promised that as we serve the Lord, he will be with us. Whatever our calling, regardless of our fears or anxieties, let us pray and then go and do, remembering the words of the Master, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who promised, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 1, 24 and 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Concerning the year in which Jesus Christ was born, the church has made no official declaration on the matter. The calendar currently used throughout most of the world was created many centuries after Jesus Christ lived, and the experts disagree about how to use existing historical information to calculate the year of his birth. Elder Bruce McConkie wrote, This is not a settled issue. Perhaps also it does not matter too much as long as we have an accepted framework of time within which to relate the actual events of Christ's life. Luke 3.23 states that the Savior began his ministry when he began to be about 30 years of age. Recorded scriptural events help us understand the length of his ministry. Jesus attended at least three annual feasts of Passover, one described in John 2.13, another in John 6.4, and another at the time of his crucifixion, described in John 11.55-57. Based on that information, Jesus' ministry lasted two years, at the very least, because of multiple recorded events that took place between the Savior's baptism and the first Passover that he attended. Most scholars place the length of his ministry at about three years. The Book of Mormon account of the physical upheavals at the time of the Savior's crucifixion attests that the crucifixion occurred in the beginning of the 34th year after Jesus' mortal birth.